All right, let's begin class with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Tyron Martyrs, pray for us. Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so in today's class, we are going to talk about the division of Aristotle's sciences, the 10 categories, and we're going to review a little bit um, the proof for the immortality of the soul, and also point out some issues uh, that it presents within Aristotle's philosophical framework. So, review from last class. Uh, we examined an effect of the soul, namely, we have the ability to know universal truths, all right, and that power to know is clearly immaterial because the knowledge that we're possessing and how we're knowing it, it, it does not conform with the nature of material reality. We then argued that the cause of that effect, all right, um, is must be material, all right. So we know something material, ergo the the powers themselves are material, ergo the uh, the soul itself is immaterial. We then flipped it to a cause and effect argument, and we said, all right, the cause is the soul is immaterial. Now, what is immaterial cannot break down; it cannot decompose. Right? There is no composition in what is material. And so, ergo, we deduce the effect that, well, that means the soul is immortal. All right? It's not going to die because that's a contradiction to its definition of it being immaterial. So, this might sound like great news at first. Like, yay, we prove that we live on after death. However, there are some issues. So, what exactly does a soul do for Aristotle after death? Well, Aristotle sees man, human nature, as being a body-soul composite. All right, there are two aspects to our nature, and they're both important. We have a body, and through our body we intake uh, sense data, and then uh, our intellect is then able to abstract universals and then know universal truths from that sense data. Well, here's the issue. When your body's gone, you're not taking in any more sense data. And if you're not taking in any more sense data, you're only left with what you acquired, the knowledge you acquired, you know, while your body was alive. And while your soul might continue to act independently of the body, all it's doing is comprehending and understanding. Which is kind of, um, not, not, I don't know if it's boring, but kind of boring. All right, it definitely lacks a lot of the zest that life has today with a bunch of other variety it has. All right, so even though it's a little bit depressing for Aristotle, he's still maintains that, you know what, no, I, even though we are a body-soul composite and death is not a good thing because it's breaking that composite that's part of our nature, it's part of who we are, um, the argument comes to this conclusion. Also, he's very influenced by Plato, his uh, teacher who taught about the immortality of the soul, and so he held on to that belief as well, uh, influenced by Plato, even though it leads to a more depressing um, understanding then you know what Plato the way Plato painted death was like oh you finally get rid of the body your intellect all right your soul can shed the body and it can go exist purely um, and Plato's way of understanding human nature is more like there's a soul in prison in a body or a soul that uses a body and then once you die the soul can just go on and not have to be limited by the body Whereas for Aristotle, like, no, the body was part of who you are. The body is you, actually. 
all right? And there's this immaterial aspect of your soul that goes on, but you know, this is a drastic change in your mode of existence. So that kind of, uh, just wanted to sum that up, that issue for Aristotle, okay? Remember, Aristotle's a pagan, he's not a Christian, right? Um, so it's amazing that Aristotle proves um, the immortality of the soul. Aristotle actually also does prove uh, the existence of what he calls a, an unmoved mover, that's pure intellect, um, in, uh, I believe it's in his Metaphysics, he does that, his book on Metaphysics. Um, but it's not like this unmoved mover, right, which we can take that proof that he comes up with and then say, well, this is what we call, this is what we refer to as God. Um, it's not like this unmoved mover is this loving thing that, you know, wants to take the, uh, you know, the soul separate from their bodies and give them some kind of place in paradise. He doesn't really have that notion. Um, the Greek notion of the afterworld actually is typically pretty dismal. Um, if you look at their mythology. So, all right. So let's take a step, couple steps back and let's start talking about abstraction again. So if you remember from last class, abstraction was the process by which uh, our agent intellect was able to take out the form, abstract the form from the phantasms, right, of our material uh, imagination and then uh, allowed the potential intellect to then know that uh, form completely separated from matter, right? In an immaterial way, uh, our intellect can know forms. So for Aristotle, there's different processes, all right? There's different levels of abstraction. And based on the different levels of abstraction, he also has his division of three main types of science. All right, and so before we get into that though, I first wanna talk about the 10 categories of being. So the 10 categories of being are, the first is substance. Substance is, it's, the categories of being is a way of referring to modes of existence, okay? So you are a substance. Uh, the brick on the back of this wall behind me is a substance, all right? A substance is something that's composed of form and matter. Uh, doesn't always have to necessarily have matter because it could refer to things such as angels, uh, which are immaterial, they don't have any matter. Um, we'll talk about more, talk about them in more detail when we get into St. Thomas Aquinas. All right, but a substance is something that exists in and of itself, right? It doesn't exist in something else, it exists independently. Um, the second, all right, so that's the first category. The other nine categories of being are all accidents, all right? Uh, so think of substance as determined by a substantial form, and then the rest of these, quantity, quality, action, passion, relation, time, place, position, and attire, these are, uh, these come into existence through accidental forms, all right, and they always adhere within a substance. They never exist on their own. We talked about how you never find like brown floating out in outer space. Uh, it's always existing in something like someone's hair or a coat, what have you. All right, so let's go through each of these uh, 10 categories and I'll explain them. So quantity, quantity is a reference to number. Um, it can refer to height, it can refer to weight, it can refer to uh, depth, breadth, okay? So it's, it's, some, it's something of uh, how a substance can be measured. All substances can be measured by quantity in some way, all right? Uh, so if you count up you know, the number of cells in your body, okay, you're giving, you're describing your substance in terms of its quantity. Now, notice I said all these are accidental forms. So you can uh, you know, change your quantity to a certain extent. You can get taller and shorter and still remain the same substance. substance. You can gain or lose weight, uh, you know, what have you, but you're still the same substance. So quantity is just a way of uh, putting number to a substance and how you quantify it. Um, quantity is the, uh, it's first because it's the primary 
accident. It's the primary attribute. It's the primary uh, mode of being that all others then follow. All right, so next is quality. Qualities that you have are determined by your quantity, ultimately, according to you know, the Aristotelian framework. So um, qualities would be things such as, is it good? Is it bad? Is it virtuous? Is it well made? All right, and so uh, to go back to like the Greek perspective of the world, so the Greeks, uh, you know, in their art and architecture had found what they believed to be the ideal uh, form of beauty, which was a, a well-proportionate body. Like your arms should be as long as your uh, body is from feet to head. Uh, your face should be, or your nose should be about one third the length of your face, etc. cetera. Um, and so in that way, you can kind of see how like the quality of like, let's say beauty for the Greeks is contingent upon the quant quantity, all right? What is the length of your arm, all right? If your arms are longer, then your body is tall or short, well then you're gonna be some kind of gangly creature <laughs> for the Greeks, all right? And the quality um, of the beauty of that body, or let's say they're, you know, you're chiseling a statue and then you messed it up because the fingers are too long, so the statue looks weird. Okay, so it because the quantity is off, right? The length of something, it then, uh, you know, determines what kind of quality statue you have there. Um, action is what it says it is. It's an activity, all right? So teaching, uh, running, jogging. These are act actions or accidental forms that you can have. Thinking, um, just because you're running doesn't change your substance, right? But it's this accidental quality that you possess. Then after action is passion. Uh, passion means to undergo something, passivity. Uh, so when you act, you are, um, you know, you're changing something about reality, okay? Uh, you're either moving yourself from place to place, or maybe you're, you know, you're acting, you're flipping a book. Okay, you're the one who's imposing uh, your will on reality in, in a degree. Passivity is the opposite of that. Passivity is when you receive an action. Okay, so say I do the act of flipping pages in a book. The book is then receiving that action. All right, and so in its way, you can talk about the book as having the accidental form of having its page flipped. All right, uh, so we commonly hear about passion, you think of, you might think of like emotions. All right, the reason why the emotions are called passions is because there's something we undergo, and according to the philosophers, we don't have a whole lot of control over. All right, um, when, you, you're, when you're angry, smitten with love, jealousy, uh, fear, okay, it's not like you can just turn that switch off. All right, if you're in a basement and the lights go out and you're all of a sudden afraid, the emotions attack you in this kind of sense, and so it's something you're undergoing. Um, you'll also hear the passion in reference to the passion of Jesus Christ, right? Which is a theological way of looking at what happened to him is uh, God, all right, the God man allowed himself to be beaten and then crucified, okay? It's something he underwent, all right? Things were being done to him, all right, that he voluntarily accepted, okay? Uh, so that's why we call it the passion of Christ. So action and passion, doing and then receiving action. Uh, next is relation. And relations are, uh, just as I said, quantity causes quality and then everything else. Um, relation is caused by action. So the fact that you have the relationship of, say, um, son and father or daughter and mother, that relationship, okay, that, that's an accidental form, okay, that is determined by some activity that was done, all right? The act of begetting creates the relationship of father and son. Or say you have um, a friend, okay? You don't just automatically become friends with people, but what typically happens is that you do some kind of activities together or you go through some kind of passions together. Maybe you suffer through a class with one another. Um, and then you know you go out and you spend time with each other playing sport on the same sports teams. You do all these activities, and then a relation is established because of those actions. All right. The uh, on the next side now we have time. 
time is another one of the categories. Um, you know, whether you are, are you existing at nine o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock in the morning, what have you, you're late, you're tardy, okay? Um, all those have to do with the, your uh, existence within time, okay? Which is a, a uh, accidental form, all right? Whether you live in the 21st century or the 17th century, that's an accident of time. Uh, place, simple enough, where are you? Um, I'm in the Plato's man cave in the basement, okay? You're in your, uh, at your laptops or what have you, uh, or we're, at a, we're in upstate New York, okay? All these things are accidental to us. Position, different from place. Place is your location, position is like your posture. So you're probably sitting down. Or you could be standing or kneeling. All these things are accidental forms. And then the last of the 10 categories is attire um, or dressing or uh, another name I've heard for it is um, ownership. Okay, and so sometimes some uh, philosophers say that, you know, attire is something only proper to man because what it denotes is this idea of ownership and possession of something. And strictly speaking, only a man has uh, ownership of a thing. Um, like you could give a dog a, a scarf, right? And say, oh, it's the dog's scarf. But, you know, you can take the scarf from the dog and that's not a crime exactly, right? Um, maybe you could talk about different animals having territory and that being their possession. Uh, but it can refer to like, okay, what are you dressed in? All right, these are accidental things, um, superficial things. You're wearing glasses, you're uh, wearing a watch, what have you, socks, shoes, all that sort of thing. All right, so these are the 10 categories, and they're the 10 ways you can describe things as existing. So I said we were going to talk about Aristotle's division of science and abstraction. Well, the first science that we're going to talk about is natural philosophy. When you study natural philosophy, all right, i.e. physics, all right, remember that was the name of the first book we read by Aristotle, all right, the study of physical reality. What does physical reality do? Physical reality change it, changes it, moves, okay, and so we get our modern notion of physics. Um, when you're doing uh, physics or natural philosophy, you're studying things as they exist under all aspects of all 10 categories, all right? Every, each one of the 10 categories um, is subject to be studied under the science of natural philosophy. As a substratum of natural philosophy, we have the science of biology. All right, and what's unique about biology is it, um, it is a level of abstraction above natural philosophy because you remove the individual and you simply look at universals. All right, but you're looking at universals of these 10 uh, categories of being. The second science, the second main division of science is mathematics. All right, and what mathematics studies is simply substances and, uh, or sorry, substances and quantity. All right, so mathematics abstracts and removes the, uh, the other eight categories of being, and you just simply really focus on quantity as the main topic. And then the last uh, science, that Aristotle distinguishes is metaphysics. Metaphysics. Uh, meta means going beyond. Okay, and then physics is referring to, well, natural philosophy. So it's going beyond natural philosophy, going beyond the physical world. And what you study in metaphysics is just simply being. All right, metaphysics studies being. It studies what 
is existence. What does it mean to exist? All right, i.e. substances. Substances being the term is slightly interchangeable, though not always. Um, but it's as abstract as you can go, okay? So there's these three different levels of abstracting in science. Natural philosophy, you look at all the 10 categories in the abstract. Mathematics, you just look at quantity, substances quantified. And then metaphysics, it's the final stage of abstraction, and you are looking at uh, being only, being itself. Okay, uh, I will give you guys a fourth bonus science, all right? This uh, science was developed after Aristotle, all right, but it fits within the, you know, in this framework. Um, the fourth science is in between natural philosophy and mathematics. You have mathematical, mathematical physics. Mathematical physics. All right, uh, mathematical physics, um, it studies the content of natural philosophy, right? So you're looking at all, ten, uh, all those 10 uh, categories of existence, but you're trying to express them quantitatively only, right? You're, uh, so like the science of astronomy. Astronomy is mathematical physics. You are studying the stars, all right? Um, and you're studying different aspects of the star, how bright they are, okay? Uh, what's their speed, what's their place, what's their time, what what have you. Um, but then you apply, you, you quantify it, right, into a, a numerical system so you can then calculate the rotations of the, the night sky or you can determine how far away these stars are. Um, so our modern physics, what you'd study um, in a physics class today is this fourth intermediary science, mathematical physics. Um, and in terms of like what most people think of as a science that they like place their faith in as like some kind of creed, uh, they're referring to that kind of mathematical physics. Uh, even though there's other sciences that are uh, just as valid. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna post the study guide in the Google Classroom for you guys. Um, and yeah, we're done with Aristotle and then uh, from here on out, the course is going to focus on human nature and uh, the study of human nature uh, from a Thomistic perspective, right? So we're going to be getting into Thomistic philosophers and, this, and the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas uses a lot of Aristotle's philosophy uh, to express his ideas, so a lot of the concepts and terminology uh, you, it might feel like review at times, but it's um, it's good to go over again because repetition is the mother of learning. And then uh, you know we'll be making we'll be going to, into more detail and deeper into some of these concepts that we've already addressed. Okay, um, so that's it for today. God bless. I'll hopefully see you guys when we return to school.